I'm, I'm going to have to take my glasses off, otherwise I can't see the book. But you've all become this reassuring blur now. <laughs> um, what, what Blake didn't say about the, um, my Neely novel, which I, I wrote before, um, before the current one, is that the first five words of it are actually, this is not a novel. <laughs> um, but of course, when you, you kind of assert anything strongly enough in fiction, you're positively inviting people to disagree with you if they want to. Um, um, and I have been a long time making my way to, to fiction, partly driven onwards, um, I have to admit, by the shame of confidently holding forth here for year after year <laughs> about how fiction should be written, um, while not quite daring to go all the way myself. Um, my experience, for what it's worth, um, is that there's nothing like giving yourself uh, a kind of a big upfront plot problem um, and a fiddly stylistic thing to do to occupy the anxious front part of your mind um, and letting you relax unpanically into doing the serious stuff beneath the bonnet to do with um, the genuinely scary things to do with characterization and point of view and dialogue, particularly dialogue. Um, early on in writing, um, in writing Golden Hill, the um, novel I published this year, um, I, I found I'd, I'd hit this terrible state where all the conversations were, um, were like tennis matches, perfect, or no, more like badminton matches, with a very slowly sailing kind of <coughs> thing across, and, and everybody at the other end always in perfect position to lob it archly back again, um, um, as, if, as if each speaker knew exactly what the other one meant and was expecting them to, to say it. And, and what was more, they all sounded hideously the same. Um, <laughs> and I showed it anxiously to my wife, who said bracingly, they all sound like you, don't they? <laughs> um, and I thought of, has anyone seen Being John Malkovich? <laughs> you remember the bit where he, John Malkovich himself, goes through the tunnel into the head of John Malkovich? And there's this world where absolutely everyone is John Malkovich, um, and I felt that I had, I had uh, attained a kind of 18th century version of that, entirely populated by me in wigs and, um, <laughs> uh, and attractive panniered silk dresses. So, um, um, but what I hope I came up with was a uh, a, you know, enough artifice to generate enough urgency to to make it matter to make it matter what happened and to keep things to keep things moving all the way through. Um, the book is about a deliberately um, enigmatic young man who says his name is Mr. Smith, suspicious in itself who turns up in New York in 1746, generation before the American Revolution, when it's still um, a remarkably small town. It's got about 7,000 people in it, um, of whom about 1,000 to 1,500 are slaves, and the rest of whom are um, about half and half English and Dutch. Um, <coughs> New York slavery is one of those things which, which has been weirdly deleted from the image of the city later on because um, um, I suppose because it's more convenient to believe that slavery was a sudden thing rather than that um, it was happening all over the 13 colonies and that Benjamin Franklin, for example, um, owned slaves, which he bought as children because you could maximize your profit on them that way. Um, although he got over it later and became an abolitionist. Um, uh, so Mr. Smith turns up um, and presents a, a bill of exchange, which is 18th century financial technology for moving money long distances without having to carry cash. Um, and 
I'll read two bits. I'll read, I'll read a bit I've read before, which is um, him in the house of Lovell, the merchant he's just presented his bill of exchange to, um, um, and a, a kind of action scene from later on. Um, the thing about the bill of exchange is that it can't be verified until a message has been got back across the Atlantic to London and then the return voyage to, to New York again. So the book has has a built-in time scale of, of about two months, which kind of winds the clockwork of the book up quite tightly because that's how long Mr. Smith is going to have to wait to get his money if the money is real or how long it's going to take to detect him. Um, and we are sitting in a rather peculiar restricted vision version of third person in his head but without access to very basic things about who he is and what on earth he's doing. Um, um, in the merchant's house, he, on a dark early November evening in New York, he's following the merchant up the stairs to be given a fistful of strange New World banknotes and pauses at a doorway. The long room it opened on did have western windows, a pair of them letting in the day's last glow of light, rather the silver of rain than of the metal streaked, with a faint crimson admitting to the distant existence of the sun, brilliant light to Mr. Smith, and it burnished with borrowed brilliance the faces of the three young women in the room, plain dressed among the plain furniture. One, fair-headed, was standing at the window with her hand to her mouth. One, darker, was sitting and reading something, and one, an African servant in a white kerchief, was holding a taper to a fresh white candle. When they saw him at the door, they all turned and looked at him. He looked back. What a difference a frame makes. To Mr. Smith, gazing inward, the uprights of the painted door seemed to set out the three of them like some tableau representing the new world itself, of which his acquaintance to this point totaled 47 minutes, and which therefore he could not yet feel to be entirely solid, entirely terra firma as ordinarily founded on its bed of earth, but only to constitute a kind of scene backed by drops and flats where you must step forth at your cue to act <coughs> your part, ready or not, ignorant as yet of the temper of the audience, ignorant of the temper of the other players, which will so much determine the drama you compose together, turn by turn, speech by speech, line by line. The blonde one was extremely pretty, with a wide mouth of candid pink. The dark one, not much less so, though she seemed to have just left off scowling and her brows met in a knot. The African was turning eyes black as licorice on him in a gaze of perfect blankness. What was more, what seemed to him a rarity fitting them to model the three graces, none of the three was in the slightest marked by the pox. He would learn that this exemption was, in the colony, almost too common to deserve notice, but it had, for the moment, the force of an original astonishment. Thus, Smith, on the one side, gazing in. To the three gazing outward, however, into the dark of the stairwell where a face had bloomed and two pale hands clutching paper, he had only appeared in the ordinary aperture of an ordinary day. For them, the blue-grey pediment of Connecticut pine faced the everyday world as it always did, and they were their <coughs> everyday selves, well launched, it seemed to them, into the middle of their histories, with loves, sorrows, resentments, hopes all far advanced and long settled already into three familiar fortunes. He was the one, unshackled, as yet unconfined, the one from whom diversion or news or any other of the new worlds a stranger may contain were to be expected, and perhaps desired. For if your fortune at present is not such as pleases you, there is a prospect of mercy as much as of doom in the thought that fortune is fickle. The goddess's renown is all in her changeableness, and strangers are her acknowledged messengers. They bear with them a glimmering of new chances. When this stranger came forth to the threshold, he could be seen to be a youth of about four and twenty, dressed in plain green, wearing his own hair and short red-brown curls, smiling in a fashion that crinkled the freckles across his nose and staring shamelessly. Hello, he said. <laughs> um, as will be apparent from that, the, the 
stylistic thing I set myself was to write in something that was at least related to to 18th century prose. So it seems to me that historical fiction that wants to transport you to elsewhere ought to be transporting you where the language is concerned as well, or at least making some kind of viable negotiation between the speech of now and the speech of then, so that there is there is a difference there that puts up some resistance, but which you are also, with your other hand, helping the reader through as much as you possibly can. So my sentences are ridiculously long, but the punctuation is all designed to make it as easy as possible <laughs> to get to the end of them. Um, and I found, which probably says more about my neuroses than writing as such, that while I was worrying about the commas in sentences like that, it was relatively easy for my um, for my unconscious to, to, to calmly settle into working out what was actually happening and what Mr. Smith was going to say. Um, um, so, a bit of action. Um, by the time you got to page 260 or so, the idea was that you would have almost stopped noticing the ridiculously fancy stuff I was um, I was doing with the sentences, and it would be um, not that I'm comparing myself to Shakespeare, mind you, but it would be like going to it would be like going to the National Theatre, where after about 20 minutes or so, you stop going. I'm listening to blank verse and just go. I'm watching, I'm watching a play. Um, um, in one way, the book is composed of Mr. Smith waiting and us waiting to see to see whether the money's real and what's going to happen to him. But the 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 interval is completely filled up with a ridiculous density of events, all pushed along higgledy piggledy by the one before. So that Smith, who turns out, although charming and manipulative and um, and unreliable, um, it also turns out to be fairly hapless, um, which was a discovery of mine as I was writing it. I assumed that he would be a supremely competent, um, unreliable, dodgy person, but actually he's, he's an out-of-his-depth, hapless, dodgy person making it up as he, as he goes along. Um, um, and by, by page 266, he has, let me see, he's made, he's made a friend in New York, um, um, Septimus, the governor's secretary, um, who has his own secrets and his own reasons for getting along with an outsider, um, and has taken part in some amateur theatricals with him, in which, um, this is relevant, in which Septimus has played the villain in um, a play called Cato by Joseph Addison. He has played a villain called Sempronius, a, a, a wicked um, a wicked Roman who is secretly barbarous at heart, whereas Smith has played Juba, an African prince um, who, is, who is deeply virtuous at heart. Um, both of them, of course, powdered to the nines and looking as white as possible, so as not to confuse anyone about African princes. Um, but um, Smith is also fallen unhappily in love and it has not worked out very well. And in the aftermath of the play, working out Smith has uh, stupidly spent the night and then been discovered in extremely flagrante um, <laughs> with um, with the retired professional actress Mrs. Tomlinson who has sort of washed up in New York on tour forever um, and um, they have been detected causing, causing hideous political embarrassment to to the governor and the powers that be. Um, and Smith has been challenged to a duel, not by Mrs. Tomlinson's husband, because that would be even more embarrassing, but by his friend Septimus, who is rather better at sword fighting than he is. Um, so, uh, it's where are we? we are somewhere around December the 17th, 1746. It's extremely cold in New York, um, and it's dawn on the snow-covered common, which if you know New York now is where City Hall Park presently is. The part of the common chosen for the duel was at the western end, away from the town, towards the pot bank and the poorhouse. 
The snow had melted back to a ring of scorched turf immediately around the kiln, but otherwise lay a foot deep, and where they were had been trampled to a compacted strip, dirty white and crunching, bumped and socketed by the refrozen prints of boots going to and fro. It was a clear, cold dawn with an intermittent icy breeze blowing and a transparent flush of colour in the east beyond the pale steeples of the snowbound city. By this period of the winter, a regular traffic of merchandise across the frozen East River had been established, and from the slight rise of the common, black dots of humanity could already be seen out in the jumbled ice field, slowly dragging sacks and boxes towards the city, along a winding route where the going was smoothest. They seemed as remote as mites, and few other specimens of humanity were present. The cold and the hour had kept away most onlookers. Apart from the party assembled for the combat, a few curious paupers had come out from the poorhouse gate and were standing in the snow in their footcloths, waiting to see what there might be to see, with Achilles near them, the governor's slave, much better dressed in the governor's livery, yet keeping the distance apt to his servile status. The nearest sentry had stepped over from the palisade to watch, with his arms hugged tight round him under his greatcoat, and clouds of exhaled breath steaming out of him around the thin trickle of smoke from his pipe. Everyone wore a grave, somewhat church-going expression. Lieutenant Lennox, acting for Septimus, was as grim as Cato, who he had played in the play, as he checked that his principal's blade and Smith's sabre bought on credit were of a length and secured the agreement of the parties that, on account of the cold, they would not strip to shirt sleeves in the usual way and might fight in their coats. Septimus's face was as hard as China, as well as as white, and a lizard would have seemed less impassive. I take it there is no possibility of compounding this with an apology, said Lennox, for the sake of form. None, said Septimus instantly. Very good, said Lennox. Then the quarrel must be submitted to the arbitrament of arms, to blood or to the greater extremity. To satisfaction, said Septimus. Smith, seeing in the obscurity of the term a faint glimmer, said at once, I agree. Very well, said Lennox after a fractional hesitation. Gentlemen, step back, ready yourselves, commence at the fall of the handkerchief, at break at the command, break. Smith stepped back until perhaps twenty feet separated him from Septimus's stare. The fervid confusions of the night had gone, he seemed to be breathing in clacter with the bitter air. His feet were cold, yet had fallen into the fencer's position without him choosing it, ready for the dance. His friend unsheathed his sword, he unsheathed his, and held it before him, awaiting his cue. The kerchief dropped. They advanced. Smith adopted the first guard, or guard of prime, with his hand prunated. Smith, seeing this, struck fiercely at his unprotected head, which Smith countered, but barely, with a rattling move into T.S. Smith, Septimus disengaged with a rasp of steel and lunged lower in second. Smith replied in quart, quant, ceased, pre, second, oh, but really, this is useless, and no more enables the reader to see the battle than if I shouted numbers at you, which, indeed, I do appear to be doing. The truth is that I am obliged to copy these names for sword fighting out of a book, having no direct experience to call upon. I throw myself upon the reader's mercy, or rather their sense of resignation. Okay. Having previously endured this tale's treatment of the game of piquet and of the act of love, they may, with luck, by now expect no great coherence <laughs> in the reporting of a sword fight. And yet, it must be rendered somehow, as Smith experienced it panting, with blade squeaking against blade and the snow dragging at his feet, and the formal beauty of it, too, for if you had had no stake in the outcome, and hovered just above as disengaged <coughs> as a seagull from the good or ill of the parties, you would have seen an order in the stepping, the leaping, the gathering, the falling back, fit for the muses, elegant, desperate, ridiculous, willful spectacle of mortality. Come, we can do better than a stream of gallic numerals. The essence of stage <coughs> fighting is to achieve a series of clashing parries as noisy as possible, and though the parties usually cooperate in this with their blades coming together in this place and that place in the air by agreement, yet 
Smith whisking his sword at what always seemed the last possible moment into the unagreed path of Septimus's at least had half the familiar task to execute. So long as he did not try to attack, but only countered and countered and countered, he found he could just keep off the whistling onslaught at the price of being driven back and back and back. Soon they were off the trampled pathway selected as the ground and Smith was backing into deeper snow towards the spot, more or less, where the great bonfire of November the 5th had burned, but where now a surface whipped to peaks like dirty egg whites let through each foot into floundering softness. Smith was wading backward into it, slowed as if by molasses, his sword arm wavering with his balance. Yet Septimus laboured under the same disability, and his attacks too were retarded and, as it were, thickened, both moving to a slower rhythm. Even so, the impetus was considerable, and they temporarily left the seconds and the onlookers lagging behind. Smith, for the moment, finding he still possessed fingers, limbs, and head all intact, seized the chance of this peculiar privacy to say, or rather gasp, Did it really have to be you? Would you rather, panted Septimus, that it had been someone who was trying to kill you? <laughs> Do you mean you're not? <laughs> said Smith, forgetting to step back. Septimus's steel, scarcely deflected, cut past his ear so close he felt the cold of it razoring by like a concentration of winter itself, a wicked grey finger of the ice. They could imagine that if it touched him, he would crystallise around the wound. Septimus disengaged, took a half step back, caught his breath. I really am very angry with you, Richard. <laughs> He said, not loudly, I am severely tempted to cut off your ears just to make a point, so keep your guard up for God's sake, but no, I am not. The idea is to contrive some safe piece of humiliation. Oh, said Smith, I see. You don't approve? I open to the alternative. The seconds were lumbering up. No, 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 please. <laughs> Proceed. <laughs> <laughs> Smith 